That's what happened with my heart when I stopped preaching. I remember when Cheryl one time, she came into the office. She said, Pastor, I need to take your blood pressure. And I just got through preaching. She goes, my, it's so high. I said, Cheryl, I've just been preaching for an hour. <laughs> you know? It's like running a marathon. It really is, beloved, when you, if you've ever preached for a while, and the Spirit of God comes upon you, you'll see. All righty. My message this morning is the God who changes not. The God who changes not. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, the God who changes not. What's that? Junior church is dismissed. <laughs> is there anything else I forgot before we start? Uh, <laughs> Malachi chapter 3. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Malachi 3, verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to drop down to verse 6 which is my text verse this morning. The Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way uh, before me. Of course, he's speaking about John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord. He shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who shall abide the day of his coming? And beloved, this not only applies to our Lord's first advent, but of course, through his own ministry throughout the earth and the second advent, would you say amen? He shall stand when he appeareth, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Drop down to verse number 6. And then God says, Yahweh, Yehovah, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The God who changes not. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the infallible Word of God. And Lord, as we study this sermon, this aspect about your character, I pray you'd help us set aside all thoughts and focus in on the Word of God. Father, you promise us that when we congregate together on the Sabbath day, you meet with us. This is your day of rest, your day of holy convocation. Lord, us to be able to zero in and what the Spirit has to say unto us this morning. Anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, beloved, if you've read the book of Malachi, and especially here, you see that the prophet Malachi is speaking about the doctrine of God's immutability. Now, you say, Pastor, that's a big word. I do not understand what you're saying. Well, beloved, if you have ever studied science or biology, you know that mutations are changes. They are variations in a person's healthy DNA. They may change or mutate to a uh, cancer cell. I hate to speak about that, but that's basically how you can understand it. In other words, thus immutability simply means no change, no alteration, no modification or variation. The Bible states here in many other places that the God that we worship does not ever do that. Now the words change not, shana is the Hebrew word. It means, uh, it speaks of God's changelessness, His constancy, His immutability. And here God chides Jacob or the nation of Israel, ladies and gentlemen, because they had re re repeatedly broken and they had forsaken the covenant. This covenant that he made with them at Mount Sinai, he said, this is what I'm going to do for you. And they said, amen, this is what we promise we're going to do for you, Lord. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, they broke the covenant. They lied, they stole, they cheated, they deceived, they disobeyed, they apostatized. They committed wanton idolatry and immorality and infidelity of God, and yet they still wondered why God had not blessed or protected them just as he had promised. But God says, you're lucky, you sons of Jacob, that I have not utterly consumed you because of you breaking the terms of the covenant. In other words, I didn't break the covenant. You broke the covenant. It wasn't my fault. It was your fault. That's why God is saying, I am the Lord thy God. I change not. I did not break my word. You broke your word. You see, beloved, God is saying to him, you broke your co this covenant, but I upheld it. And therefore, that covenant in Deuteronomy 28 gave the conditions of God's blessings and cursings. And God says, 
I cannot, I will not, I must not ever go contrary to the words that I promised I would bless you for doing and the curses I promised it would be upon you if you broke the covenant. I can't do it. Why? Because it would be contrary to my own intrinsic and immutable character, nature, and attributes. And if that's true, beloved, if he could do that, he'd now cease to be the one God in whom we could trust. Amen? So God cannot go contrary to his word. How would you ever know that you were born again if God went contrary to his word? You wouldn't know it. You see, beloved, in Psalm 138, 2, God said, I have magnified my word above all my holy name. Would you say amen? See, God has magnified his word above his name. In other words, he's saying, I'm the God who changes not. So that's a brief snapshot or context of what's going on here when God says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. So I wanted you to see just a little bit of it because I'm going to go in an entirely different direction right now. You know, everything in life changes except God. And if you've lived long enough, you understand how change can happen immediately. Amen? You see, beloved, even as Christians, we are in a constant and continuous state and process of being changed. We're being changed morally, we're being changed spiritually, and we're being changed physically. For example, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that by the glory of the Lord we are being changed into the same image of the Lord Jesus Christ from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. How's that, Lord? By the Holy Spirit. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, when we get saved, now the indwelling Holy Spirit unleashes His supernatural power. And he begins a miraculous process in us called sanctification, setting us apart, setting us apart from the world, making us holy, making us righteous, making us godly. The early church called it the divination of the saints. It's the Christianizing of a Christian. You come into Christianity with all of your baggage, and now God says, i got to take it from you. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, this sanctification creates a radical and a fundamental moral and spiritual and ethical change in us so that now we can be just like God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, beloved, is God's perfect man, and He's man's perfect God. That's why the Scripture calls Him both the Son of Man and the Son of God. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, the Holy Spirit's job is to affect a supernatural change in our heart. This heart needs to be changed. Man's problem is not his head, it's his heart. I can't tell you how many times I've debated this with psychologists. Man comes up with all kinds of flimsy excuses to hide his problems, but what he needs is a radical, supernatural, miraculous change deep down in his heart. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, the Holy Spirit starts changing our souls and our spirit. He changes our thinking. He changes our desires. He changes our life to constantly and continuously change and conform and transform us into the image of likeness of God so we can be like God's unchangeable Son and like God Himself. See, God is doing a work in you. He hath, that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. You may forget about it, but God never does. Everything that happens in our life, I've told you, is a laboratory where God is working out your salvation in you. You see, folks, not only are we going to be changed morally and spiritually and ethically, then at the resurrection, when Christ returns, we're going to be changed physically. Our physical bodies will be changed. And we'll undergo a supernatural change, a supernatural metamorphosis, or transmutation, or transformation, or transfiguration, however you want to call it and will forever possess a glorified body just like our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's why Paul said in Philippians 3, 20, 21, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He's even able to subdue all things unto Himself. Would you say amen? And that's also why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and then he goes on to say, we shall all be changed from mortality to immortality. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that change is at the very heart of redemption. Would you say amen? You see, God saves you as you are, 
but God never leaves you as you are, does he? See, you must change. You're never good enough. He's trying to make you good. You're never righteous enough. He's trying to make you righteous. You're never holy enough. He's trying to make you holy. You're never godly enough, but he's trying to make you godly. Would you say amen? In other words, he's changing us. You see, beloved, and he's going to change your body. And if you're like me, you know your body can use a little change hereafter, especially if you get a little bit older, amen? You know what I'm talking about. Now, there's six amazing facts and truths I'd like to give you to help you mold and shape your soul in life and better understand this God who changes not. We have a tendency to think sometimes that because everything around us is changing, then that's okay with God. He just kind of adapts to us, and He changes also. But that's not true. That's human philosophy. That's man-made beliefs. It has nothing to do with what the infallible and inerrant Word of God has to say. Amen? So the first thing I want you to see is God's persona is unchangeable. Or God's person, you could say. Persona kind of covers everything. His attributes, His nature, His being. God's persona is unchangeable. James 1.17 says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now the word variableness, paralege, means there's no changes in God, no variations or alterations. There's no fluctuations in God. God is always the same. And James says he is the father of lights. What's he mean? He means the celestial light in the heaven. James is saying that although the sun, the moon, and the stars are in a constant and continuous change and flux, God isn't. Now, beloved, think about the lights that are in the heavens. God's the father of them. He created them. He spoke the word, and they were created. Amen? But think about it. They rise. They set. Sometimes they burn brighter than other times. Sometimes they're dimmer than other times. Sometimes they cast shadows. They're constantly changing. But God is not ever changing. Would you say amen? In Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday in the Old Testament, that's the past. Today in the New Testament, that's the present. And then he says forever. That's proleptically into the future. How's that? I kept it in peace for you. But Jesus never changes, and Jesus is God. God of every God, light of every light, truth of every truth. Now hear me now. All things change in this world and life. They never say, uh, are the same. Have you ever had a real good day, and you say, boy, I wish it would always stay like that. You already know it's not going to. But you have to have that same attitude when you have a bad day. You have to know, I'm having a bad day today. I know it's not always going to be like this, amen, because nothing stays the same. Everything changes, beloved. I'm saying this, that times change, that people change. I'm saying that we change and seasons change and the weather changes. I'm saying that nations change and cultures change, good, bad, or indifferent, but not our God. Our God never changes. He is constant. He is consistent. He never fluctuates. Irrespective of what men have to say, they think because all of we're seeing on social media, on TV, on the internet, well, God must understand. He's like this. He must be adapting to what we're doing. Beloved, I want to tell you something. You're supposed to adapt to Him, not to you. Now, that's Bible, whether you like it or you don't like it. But I'm saying God never changes, beloved. He's unchangeable. You cannot alter God, beloved. He's unvarying. He's the only infinitely and permanently fixed moral and spiritual being, compass, and constant in this ever-changing world of variables. Everything around us, you see, is changing, but not our God. Amen? And I'm so thankful for that. That I have a God I know from the Old Testament into the New Testament has always been the same. That He's never changed. Our beloved... What God is today, He always was or never began to be. And all that God is at this present moment, He always has been and forever will be. Now, I want you to pay attention to me. God cannot change for the better because He's already intrinsically perfect, beloved. And being perfect, He can neither change for the worse. We can. 
We can get gooder. How do you like that word? And then we can get worse, but not God. Beloved, God cannot change in age and become younger or older because He just eternally exists as He ever shall be. God cannot change or improve in development or degenerate to moral and spiritual and ethical imperfection or debasement. Why? Because He says, the testimony of His own mouth, His own words, His own lips, He says this. He says, I am perpetually and permanently always the same. Now, either God is a liar or we've had to change our thinking. And the Bible says God cannot lie in Titus 1 2. God cannot lie. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying the flight of time does not affect him like it does us. I'm saying our God does not have wrinkles on his brow like we do as we age. And, beloved, his power cannot diminish nor his glory ever fade. I'm saying that the God we worship today who created everything always was and is and ever shall be, he is the unchangeable and immutable God. He's the God who changes not. He'll always be infinitely holy. He'll always be infinitely righteous and just. He'll always be infinite truth. He'll always be kind and merciful. He'll always be loving. He'll always be the same, infinitely be the same. Would you say amen? You see, God won't change. Oh, how we need to embrace this truth today in this hectic and fast-paced, ever-changing world of ours. Why, Pastor Joel? I'll tell you why, beloved, because this means that he's like an immovable mountain of granite in a desert of sinking sand or an ocean of raging turbulence to us. In other words, beloved, he produces stability in our life. He produces constantly and strength in our life. He produces hope in our life when everything around us uh, is in a constant and continuous state of flux and change and chaos. He is not. And we can count on that. We can take it to the bank. Then no matter what I feel, no matter what I see, no matter what's going on around me, I know, I know, I know God will not change. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. See, God will not change. What am I saying? I'm saying our God is the one and only uncreated, uncaused cause that has ever existed. And He's not subject to age like us. He's not subject to time like us. He's not subject to decay or deterioration like us. He's not subject to any weakening or corruption like we are, beloved. He alone is innately immutable. Now that's why James 1.17 says, With Him is no variableness, none, neither shadow of turning. Sun casts shadows, they get bigger, they get longer. The moon casts shadows, they get bigger and longer. But God is always the same. Amen? The shadow He casts at creation, and the shadow He cast at Mount Sinai, and the shadow He cast when Jesus walked the earth is the same shadow He's casting today. Because God cannot change. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this eternal, unchangeable God who has always existed is our fixed and secure and immovable, now listen to me, rock of stability in our life in a fast-paced, changing world. And you need to hold on to that. Beloved, you hear me. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2 says it like this. Now listen to what he says. He says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. And he goes on to say this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Would you say amen? From everlasting to everlasting, thou art the immutable, unchangeable, infinite God. God never changes. We do. You see, beloved, never before has this truth been so needed by a chaotic world that is in a constant, and a continuous state of fluctuation and instability. I, I, I mean, as I look around, beloved, I, I see people are grabbing and grasping at anything in this world that will stay put. Something they can hang on to and give them some peace and stability and security in our life. But we take it for granted sometimes, beloved. But we, uh, it's wonderful for us as Christians to know that we have a God who is stable, a steadfast God, beloved, and He's strong and He's trustworthy, and we can hold on to Him, amen? And we know He won't change, that He'll do what He says He's going to do in our life. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying, number one, God's persona is unchangeable. Number two, 
God's precepts are unchangeable. This book is unchangeable. And it's amazing to me because people will rather read stuff on the internet, read human books, books about books, books about God, but they don't know anything about the book. And that's what the word Bible means. It means the book. The book of all books. The books that exalted above every other book in this world. Now, God's precepts are unchangeable. What does he mean? God's word and commandments can never change either. Because they are as immutable as he is beloved and they originate from the very mind and mouth of God. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 16. He said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot and one tittle shall in no wise pass till all things be fulfilled. 1 Peter chapter uh, um, 1, verse 25 echoes that. He says, the word of the Lord endures forever. And David said in Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now we quote that sometimes, but do we ever think about what it really means to us in our life? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now the Hebrew word settled, not sab, means that for all eternity and throughout all the endless ages, God's word contained in the Holy Bible. Now listen, it means it's forever set. It's forever stationed. It's forever fixed and established in heaven where God lives. It can never ever be changed. It can never ever be altered. It can never ever be amended, beloved. Now hear me. Every moral and spiritual precept, every moral and spiritual statue and commandment, every moral and spiritual word that God ever spoke to man is unalterably and permanently and eternally fixed into heaven. It cannot ever be edited. It cannot ever be corrected. It cannot ever be, ever be modified. And it cannot ever be revised or rewritten. Why, Pastor? Because it is the infallible and inerrant and infinitely timeless and changeless truth given by an immutable God. Now, beloved, to be set in heaven, if you folks who have ever worked with cement know you have to work and do your work quickly. Why? Because the cement starts doing what? It starts settling and it starts setting and then it gets hard and then you're not going to work with it. God said, my word is set in heaven. You can trust that. You can take it to the bank. You ought to believe it. You ought to hold on to it. You'll always know where you stand with me if you know my word. You see, beloved, do you ever think about this? The same moral and spiritual truths that were spoken to Adam and Eve, the same moral and spiritual truths that were spoken to Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Israel, the same moral and spiritual truths that were spoken to all of the prophets and all of the priests and all of the kings in the Old Testament and to the apostles uh, in the New Testament, beloved, now listen to me, are likewise as applicable and relevant and spoken to us today in the 21st century. Amen? Jesus' word did not change. God's word does not change. His morals do not change. His spirituality does not change. His ethics do not change. Ours do, but we are to conform ourselves to what he says in his word. You hear me, beloved? God's word will never change. Isaiah the prophet went to Israel. And he was in Israel, but he went to the people of Israel. And they were always, one day they were hot, one day they were cold, like a lot of Christians today. One day they're left, one day they're right. One day they're going to serve God, next day they don't know what they're going to do. They lied, they cheated, they committed all kinds of harms. So Isaiah said this in chapter 40, verse 8. He says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You children of Israel, you want to know where you stand with your God? Measure what he said to you in the covenant. Measure what he said to you through me and through all of the prophets, and you'll know exactly where God stands. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, why? Because it comes from the God who changes not. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. So the scriptures are consistent. The scriptures are truthful and trustworthy, beloved. They are dependable. Why? Because they are God's immutable, infallible, unchanging word. And they are not the mere words of man. They are not the mere opinions of man or thoughts or views of man. They are not 
the mere beliefs of man. They come from the God who changes not. Would you say amen? So what have I taught you so far? Number one, God's persona is unchangeable. Number two, God's precepts are unchangeable. Number three, God's promises are unchangeable. God's promises are unchangeable. Beloved, God's promises of blessings and threats and curses are just as sure and they're just as steadfast as His person, His nature and character are. So because God does not change, His promises to us don't change either. I want you to listen to what he said to the, uh, through the prophet Ezekiel to the children of Israel. In Ezekiel 12, 24, God said this. Now listen to what he says. He says, For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I speak shall come to pass. Did you hear that? What a promise that is. The words that I speak will come to pass. Let me give you an ellipsis. Dot, dot, dot. In your life. How's that? What a promise to you and I. God's word will come to pass in our life. Beloved, did you know that there are over 7,400 promises in the Bible? I remember one time someone counted them. They said there were 7,443. I don't know where he came up with that figure, but there's a lot. Over 7,400 promises in the Bible, beloved. It is God's promise book to you and I. But, beloved, to receive them, we must first claim and confess them so they'll ultimately be manifest in our life. It's not enough just to read them. A lot of people do that. A lot of people will see it. They'll write a card. They'll put it on their mirror. They'll put it in their bathroom mirror. They'll put it on their bureau. They'll put it in their car. But they will not claim it. They will not confess it. But listen to me. There's promises of salvation. And there's promises of hope and help and healing. There's promises of deliverance. There's promises of guidance. And blessed be God, there are promises of answered prayer. God answers prayer. He promises He'll do it. If you pray according to His will, He says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, I promise you I will answer your prayer. Now that's pretty good, isn't it? And yet so few Christians, they're just sitting there hoping against hope. They say, well, I believe the Bible, but they don't believe it enough to claim it. Now, that's amazing. Intellectually, we fill our minds with it, but it doesn't drop down 18 inches into our heart. And it needs to, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me. For example, God says this in the Bible in Jeremiah 33.3. He says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knewest not. Have you been calling and calling and keep on calling to God? God says, I'll answer it. Beloved, God says in the Bible in Joshua 1.9, He says, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest, wherever you go. God says in the Bible in Psalm 50 and verse 15, He says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. You got a day of trouble? God is a refuge, and strength, a very present help in a time of trouble, isn't He? Psalm 46.1. And yet, beloved, I don't know why we don't think this living word from the living God really is true for us in our life. We try to work it out ourselves. We go to the doctor, we go to the lawyer, we go to this person, we go to that person. Yet God says, I will honor my word. Beloved, God says in the Bible, in Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3, He says, Fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kill upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, Joel. I ought to put my name there, you ought to put yours. I am your Savior. Your doctor's not your Savior, your lawyer's not your Savior, your friends and family are not your Savior. Bless God, I'm your Savior. Would you say amen? What are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying there are literally thousands of promises like this in the Bible that can never be waived, that can never be disavowed or denied, beloved, that can never be recanted or broken by our God because our God is God who changes not. You see, beloved, His words are immutable like Him. 
They're unchangeable like Him, beloved. Like Him that gave them, beloved. And they're part of His intrinsic nature, infallibly spoken. And God keeps His immutable Word, doesn't He? He keeps His immutable persona and precepts and promises so they can be fully trusted by us. I wouldn't give you a plumb dime for a God who changed His Word and was always changed. I wouldn't give you a dime for a God like that, would you? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't give you a, I wouldn't spend my time, beloved. And I've been a Christian a long time, a pastor a long time. But I would not give you one dime for a God that changed on me like that. You see, that's what the pagans' gods were. They, the, the pagans were always offering up child sacrifices and sacrifices. They never knew which way God was going to be that day. They're God. But our God is not like that, is He? You see, beloved, God keeps His word. You hear me now. What are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying this. Because we always have to be able to apply the Word of God to our lives. I'm saying, beloved, that whenever you're troubled, whenever you're worried, whenever you're anxious, and a lot of people get anxious or unhappy, whenever you are stressed, distressed, or depressed, then open up your Bible and ask God to guide you to a promise of His that you can stand on. Amen? Then through faith, beloved, you need to claim it. You need to lay hold of it, the Bible says, of that divine promise, and God will indeed answer and bless you because He promises you He will honor that promise to you. If you claim it, if you believe it, if you keep holding on to it, beloved, God says to you, I will answer that in your life. But you say, Pastor Joel, I can't find one. Beloved, there are over 7,000 and you can't find one promise. Ask God and He'll direct you to one. How's that? Pray to God. He'll the one through His providence and by His Spirit, He'll guide you to be able to find that exact promise that you need. And beloved, when you do, then what you need to do is open up your Bible. Then you need to be able to find and claim one of those promises, then rightly interpret it and obey its conditions. Because a lot of these promises are conditional. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. What if we don't confess them? I heard a hyper-grace preacher the other day saying, all of our sins are forgiven past, present, and future, and uh, so therefore we don't have to confess our sins. I said, bless God, I'm hollering at the TV. What does he mean then when he's talking to the saints if we confess that? It's just amazing. The provision for our sins for the future was already paid for. Before you got saved, your sins were already paid for, but the blood hadn't been applied yet. Amen? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that God promises you that if you focus all of your trust, you focus all of your energies, uh, beloved, all of your faith on the unchangeable God that gave and stands behind all of these promises, brother, uh, uh, beloved, and then patently wait till he answers it, and indeed he will, and when he does, you want to make sure you give him all the praise, all the glory, all the thanks, uh, all the honor, beloved, because God honors his word. Listen to me, when you make a promise... You have to, or God makes a promise, and you claim that promise. You have to look at that promise through the infallible lens of God's perspective and not your own fallible human perspective or problem. Amen? The problem Satan makes look to us like it's insurmountable. There is no way, humanly speaking, I know the way these things play out in life. Get real, Pastor. And yet God says, with Him all things are possible. Am I going to listen to you who are as fallible as I am? As weak and corruptible as I am? The society, this evil world system that Satan's the God of, am I going to believe them? Or am I, as a saint of God, a son of God, a servant of God, a seeker of God, a sheep of God, a steward of God, am I going to listen to Him? I think I'll stay with God. How about you? You see, beloved, I love that I know I can sit back after I claim and I can watch God start providentially moving and answering those prayers in my life. I love what 2 Peter 1.4 calls them. He says this. He says, they're exceeding great and precious promises. And they are. They're not just great. They're exceeding great. They're not just precious. They're exceedingly precious. And so, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, but first, you've got to find one. But first, you have to claim one. 
But first you have to stand on one. But first you have to focus on one, beloved. Then God will providentially, providentially meet your need. So God's persona is unchangeable. God's precepts and promises are unchangeable. Why? Because he's the God who changes not. The Bible says in Psalm 103, 1 through 4, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget all, all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy soul from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. How's that for a promise? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Lift up your hands, lift up your heart, lift up your eyes and see the living God who sits on the throne of the universe. You say that it, Pastor Joel? No, more. I mean, beloved, hold it, there's more. Number four, God's purposes are unchangeable. God's purposes in your life, His plans in your life are unchangeable. Did you know this? That from the moment you were born, God already saw your moral and spiritual and physical makeup, beloved, and knew what you'd be like. And yet what amazes me, he still called us and saved us in spite of it. <laughs> he must have looked at me and said, that little rascal down there, I'm going to make him a preacher to get back at him for all the things he did wrong. <laughs> oh, beloved, you know the good news and bad news? You ever hear the, so many stories like that, good news and bad news, right? Uh, i never forget Ronnie Dangerfield one time, he says, he said he went to the dentist. The dentist said, I got good news and bad news for you. He said, what's that? He says, the good news is you're going to need dentures. And they cost $5,000. He said, what's the bad news? He says, you're going to need braces too. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you, I don't get no respect. He said, I went to the psychiatrist and told him I was having thoughts of suicide. He told me I had to pay in advance from then on. <laughs> oh, beloved, isn't that true, though, with the way men... Uh, but, beloved, God says this in Romans 8, 28. And we know, and we what? And we know that all things work together for good to them that live God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You hear me now? If you're here today and you're a Christian, God has a specific plan and purpose for your life so you can serve and glorify Him, beloved, and it's your responsibility to find out what it is. Now listen to me, he's not going to send you an email. He's not going to send you a text. He's not going to do that, beloved. He's already gifted you. He's already given you the skills and the talents and the abilities you're going to need to do it. He's already placed the desires in your heart and opened up the opportunities for you to serve him in that capacity. And he'll not change his mind in that calling of that plan and purpose he has in your life. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. They don't change. Listen to me. If God has called you to be a preacher and you become a carpenter all your life, you'll be a miserable feeling carpenter because you'll never be fulfilling the destiny God had called you to or the plan he called you to. And a lot of preachers run away. I remember uh, there was a preacher, uh, and I won't give you his whole name. His first name was Tom. That's all I can say, not Tom Day. But he had been called to preach before he went into the Marine Corps. And beloved, he ran into the Marine Corps to run away from God. And after, in, in them days, in the Vietnam War, you had a, the minimum tour of duty you had was 13 and a half months. He was in his 13th month, thought he had scathed, and he had a black friend with him who always said, listen to me, you need to get right with God. You need to come to God. You need to be a preacher. God has called you to be a preacher. He says, I've got my own life. Two days later, he stepped on a mine and blew both of his legs off. And as he's laying there, his friend picks him up, and he said, oh, I'm going to preach from now on. I'm going to preach. I, if I'm a legless preacher, just let me live, God. Just let me live, oh, God. Well, he lived, and he became quite a preacher, too. And he preaches all the time in his Marine Corps uniform, sitting in a wheelchair. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You know, beloved, and he's not going to change his mind in this matter either. You might change your mind. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, God said this even to harden Pharaoh. When I quote, he said this to Pharaoh. He said, Pharaoh, for this purpose have I raised thee up to show in thee 
my power and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Oh, beloved, how much more he will do this for you as a child of God. That his power and his name will be manifest in all the earth through you, through your testimony, through your witness, through the way you live, ladies and gentlemen, to the gospel that you preach. We need to preach the gospel. We let the, need to let the lion out of the cage, so to speak. Amen? The power is already, it's the power of God under salvation to everyone who believes it. We just need to let it out. <laughs> Take the pin out of the grenade, uh, so to speak. You see, beloved, that's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Did He lie to us? Is that a promise, yes or no? Does God promise He will direct your paths? You will hear His voice saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. And that secret voice, that still, small voice in your heart. This is the way, walk ye in it. But you have to settle down and listen for God moving in your life. Paul says in Philippians chapter 12 and verse 13, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now, do you hear that? To will. God gives you the desire, the will. And then He gives you the power, beloved. He says, both to will and to do. He divinely enables and empowers you to do His good pleasure. Not yours. Not yours. Well, my pleasure is to do this. My pleasure is to do that. God says, that's not my plan or purpose for your life. You'll never be satisfied. That's why so many Christians are miserable at work, by the way. They go to work to get a paycheck, but they're discontent in their heart. Why? Because they're not fulfilling the Word of God in their life, what God has really called them to be. You see, beloved, we have a tendency to measure success by the amount of money we make. And that's the wrong way to go, isn't it? If I was happy just picking up cans, beloved, I'd pick up cans the rest of my life. Well, I know I'm going to heaven. God promised it. I know I'm going to have a grand glorified body. God promised it. So if picking up cans gives me joy and brings me in touch with a lot of people that I can share the gospel, and by the way, I knew a man one time, I was studying down Plymouth Beach at 5.30 in the morning, and I saw this guy come down with a brand new Toyota pickup truck, and I got this old jalopy. And I made, out of clothes hanger, I made a little bracket I could put on my steering wheel so I could put my Bible there so I could write. And I look, and, he's and I'm way down the end of Plymouth Beach, and he's checking all of the trash cans. He's looking in, and I see him reach in, goes to the back of his truck, throws them in a plastic bag, goes to the And finally, when he got to me, I was, there was a barrel right in front of my right side of my truck. I looked, and I knew who it was. I'll just say his name was Tony. I said, Tony! I said, what are you doing up this way in the morning? He says, you see this truck? He says, I pay for it. He was retired by picking up cans every morning. Well, that sounds good to me, man. From that day forward, I started picking up cans. No, I'm only <laughs> I still got the old truck, right? 18 years old. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that God's purpose for your life is immutable, but we're improvisers. What do you mean by that, Pastor Joel? I mean we settle for second best and we just want to do our own thing. Consequently, we often miss God's great, unchangeable purpose in our life. We zig when we should have listened to God and zag. We pursue this when we should have listened to God and pursued that. Beloved, we uh, literally, uh, um, uh, what am I thinking here? Turn left when we should have turned right. And you see, beloved, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We're doing what we want to do. And how did that work out in your life? How did it work out in your life? Not very well at all, I venture to say. And so that's why we're so unhappy and dissatisfied and discontent, beloved. You see, when you interfere with God's purpose in your life and you improvise in your own plans, for His plans for you, you're going to lose your direction in life and never reach your full potential. It's not God but you who has changed God's purpose in your life, beloved. It's not His fault. It's yours. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. And it's not, beloved, God's change. It's the quality and the character of the object that has changed. And I mean that's us, isn't it? You see, beloved, God is consistent. He'll always do the right thing. 
It's us who are inconsistent and often miss his purpose for our life. Samuel went to the children of Israel, who were so backslidden at that time, and he said this in 1 Samuel 15, 29. He said, The strength of Israel will not repent, for he is not a man that he should repent, slash, change. That's what that word repent means there, metanoia. So, beloved, this, God's persona is unchangeable. God's precepts and promises are unchangeable. His purpose is unchangeable. Number, four, uh, number five, God's provisions in your life are unchangeable. I love this because we all have needs and we have a God in heaven who cares about them and he also promises you and I that he's going to meet them. Is there something God needs to meet in your life today? Again, James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. See, beloved, it comes down from God, amen? It's a gift to you in your life. And we can be sure that God is absolutely consistent and dependable in providing for us. Listen to me. The same God who provided a spring for Hagar in the desert provided fonts of water for Israel in the wilderness. The same God that brought Elijah bread and meat via a raven and air meal also rained down manna and meat for millions in Israel for 40 years during their wilderness wanderings. The same God who used Elijah the prophet to miraculously provide barrels full of meat and oil or meal and oil from a handful of flour and a cruise of oil for the widowed woman of Zarephath and her son for three years also used the Galilean of Nazareth to multiply a few little loaves and fishes that miraculously feed thousands, beloved. And he is the same God who also promises to meet your need and provide for you. Lord, we only have a couple little fishes and a few loaves of bread. Jesus said, you got too much. <laughs> you better give some back. <laughs> now, beloved, I love it. He, says, he said to the apostles, and I made a little note in my Bible about this. He says, how many fish and how much bread do we have? And they told him. He says, bring your baskets over here. I can just see Jesus, there's 12 apostles, 12 baskets, ripping a piece of bread, throwing it in one basket. Another basket, a little piece of fish, throwing it back in the baskets. So they walk around. Can you imagine you're an apostle? You look down, there's a half a piece of bread, or a piece of bread, and a piece of a fish. And there's 5,000 men, not including women and children. And they're walking over to them. They're sitting down saying, these people are going to laugh me to scorn. I mean, look at it. So he says, I'm going to go to John first because he, he's my friend. Better get yours first. And so he takes it, and John's wife takes it, and John's kids take it, and he looks down and he says, there's still that one little piece of bread. <laughs> and he goes over and over, and beloved, everybody eats there. And then Jesus says, pick up the leftovers, bring them up. We don't waste anything here. You don't like leftovers? You would then. You see, beloved, did God meet their needs? They were out in the wilderness. They had no food. They had no money. They had no place they could buy food, but yet God supernaturally intervened in their life. And beloved, that's why God says, I have superabundant blessings and resources and means that you know not of, and they are utterly inexhaustible, utterly unlimited, utterly boundless, and infinitely endless, beloved. And that's why Paul said in Philippians 4.13, but my God... My God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's why Paul said that, because a lot of the Philippians thought, well, you know, we've given all this love offering right here. We've got nothing. And God says, Paul said to him, you just have to, before you can reap, you have to sow. Amen. And by the way, if you're not sowing your tithe and offering, you're wondering why you can't live off 120% of your income? Well, man rob God? How have I robbed you? In tithe and offerings, God says. But I'm not going to go that route. What am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying simply this. That God promises you and I that He's going to meet our needs. You know, it's amazing. When we're flat broke, somehow He provides enough money so we can get by. Beloved, when we're sick, somehow He provided just the right doctor and just the right medicine so we could get better. Beloved, sometimes when we're uh, out of job, you hear this, Judy? God says, I'm going to provide you a job that's just right for you at the right time that you need it. 
Beloved, you hear me, God always meets our needs. A lot of people say to me, Pastor Joel, I'm lonely. But listen, God provides just the right person to be their companion sometime, to be their friend, to befriend them, doesn't he? Because God promises, if you look to me, look to me, all you ends of the earth. And I promise you, I will meet your needs. I'll never forget how years ago in pastor school in Chicago, beloved, how God supernaturally provided for me. There's a missionary there that was giving a testimony about his wife who came down with a most severe case of spinal meningitis. The doctor said that the, her, her spinal fluid was like milk. It was so infected. Had so much poison in it. And beloved, what happened was he was there to give his testimony so we could take a collection. And we took a collection, beloved, for this desperately sick woman because she needed to be able to get transportation, emergency transportation, and emergency treatment from Israel and be flown to the United States. He got through giving his testimony. All of us were crying. Everybody there. And they took a collection, beloved, and what little money I had, and I'm I'm not trying to sound noble, I gave every cent that I had. And then it dawned on me, there's three more days left in pastor school. How are you going to eat, Joel? And I said, ah, I can fast for three days. I'm saying to myself, well, beloved, the next day when I woke up, and there were six of us in one room, someone had given me a suit, and it was hanging in the closet, and I, I had gone, already gone through that suit. My wife had uh, ironed the suit, and I hadn't seen a $100 bill in I don't know how long, but it was a brand new, crisp $100 bill in that suit pocket. Where did it come from? You see, beloved, God was looking at God loves a cheerful giver. He sa- Is that a promise? And when you give from your heart, beloved, God promises to give to your life and provide all of your needs. Amen? So the same God who provided for the people of the Bible provides also for you. And beloved, He hears your cries and He hears your pleas for help. The same God who heard and helped Abraham leave Ur of the Chaldees and helped his older wife Sarah be able to get pregnant is the God that will help you. Beloved, the same God who heard Jacob, helped Jacob leave Laban, beloved. He went there as a pauper and he came back a rich man is the same God that will help you. The same God who helped Moses, beloved, in the... 40 years of wilderness wanderings is the same God that will help you. The same God, beloved, who helped Joshua conquer the land of Canaan. Imagine, beloved, you're, you don't have a real trained army. And there's giants in the land. Yet God says, I'll provide for you. You'll conquer them. The same God that helped and heard the cries of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace will help you. And da- Daniel in the lion's den, beloved. And Peter or Paul. Uh, the apostles, beloved, to be able to minister for the Lord and do miracles like this is the same God who says, I hear your cries and I will answer your cries. I'll do it for you. So aren't you glad that God's nature is unchangeable? Aren't you glad that God's character and being and persona is unchangeable? His word is unchangeable? Beloved, His benevolent attitude toward us is always the same. His love and His care and His kindness is always the same. His compassion to you is always the same. His tender mercies and graces to you is always the same. Why, preacher? He's the God who changes not. You see, beloved, we know this to be true because Hebrews 13 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Listen to me. We change, but God doesn't. People change, but God doesn't. Societies and nations and cultures change, but God doesn't. Minds change, but God doesn't. Feelings change, but God doesn't. As Christians, we know, we know that there's no change in God. You may be rich today and poor tomorrow. You may be sick today and well tomorrow. You may be happy today and sad tomorrow. But none of these things will ever change our relationship with God one iota because He still loves us as His child. Amen. And beloved, our relationship with God far exceeds these minor temporary aforementioned things and moods and feelings in our life. So I'm saying when the world spins too fast and seems way out of control and constantly and continuously changes, we need to focus on the immutability of the God who changes not. We need to meditate on these unchangeable persona and precepts and promises and purposes and provisions. Now let me close with this. And I was hesitant to put this in my sermon, but it's needful that I do. Number six, God's precautions are unchangeable. 
Now listen to me, and you folks watching my television. God's precautions are unchangeable. The Bible is literally filled with admonitions and warnings from God. Amen? Amen? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of his enemy, the Bible says. Now listen to me. I wish I could tell you that there's no dark or frightening or terrifying side to the immutability of God, but I can't do it. And folks, I would, wouldn't be a faithful pastor to you if I didn't give you the whole counsel of God. I just wouldn't. So God warns that all those who reject Christ, they reject the gospel. He warns all those impenitent backsliders. He warns all those unfaithful and lukewarm believers who live in sin and disobey His commandments that His judgments and His justice, justice are also unchanging. Now we forget that. But remember, justice and judgment is also a part of God's intrinsic nature. And God cannot change. Amen? He says that if you don't repent, then you shall surely die. You'll split hell wide open. You'll be in the lake of fire. Jesus warned that those who reject Him, those who refuse to repent, will go to hell. And I get no pleasure saying that. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, impenitent sin, is death. The Bible says in Revelation 20.15, it warns that at the great assize, that great white throne judgment on the day of judgment, it says, anyone not found written in the book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire that burneth forever and ever, and this is the second death. Now that's a promise by God. Now I want you to listen to this pastor's heart. I am so glad I was able to tell you about the unchangeable positive things that I just gave you about God. But because my job is to watch out for your souls, because my job is to fear for your soul, I'm also frightened not to tell you about the eternal danger your soul may be in if you do not take your soul and your salvation and your commitment to Christ extremely serious. A lot of Christians are not doing that today. And we need to. So we must daily and humbly walk by faith in the fear of the Lord. Beloved, not walk presumptuously. Well, God saved me back then, you know what? Not walk disrespectfully with God or carelessly or recklessly like a lot of Christians are doing right now. Never before any pastor will tell you that knows anything, that knows the statistics. Never has there been such a departure in apostate Christianity like there is today. The Bible says we're to walk circumspectly. Why? Because He's the God who changes not. Beloved, I told you, His persona is unchangeable. His precepts and promises are unchangeable. His purposes and provisions in your life are unchangeable. And His precautions are unchangeable. The question is, do you know this unchangeable God? Do you know Him? I hope you do a little bit better.